message in the series on 1 John. My message this morning is in the second chapter. And it concerns primarily verses 20, 21, and 27. However, I'm going to read verse 18 through 27. So that you'll have the background and the context of these three verses. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest, that they were not of us at all. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and I'm reading correctly, and you pay attention to this revised reading. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye all know, period. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence, not be ashamed before him at his coming. There are two very stern Warnings. I say warnings in this chapter, and yet, on the other hand, warning doesn't seem to really aptly describe these two subjects which John introduces to the little children. I assume when you warn someone that you do so with the realization that they're in danger. And I do not believe that the little children of God are in any danger from the world. I do not believe they're in any danger from the Antichrist. Therefore, these two subjects could hardly be taken as warnings. Why, then, does John bring them up? If we are in no danger from the world, and I am certain that we are in no eternal danger from the world, which is filled with his lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, because our Lord Jesus prayed in Gethsemane to his Father. And in that high priestly prayer of intercession, while on the very threshold of Calvary's cross, he committed to the loving care and to the security and to the keeping power of his Father all who had been given to him through the work of the cross. And the pledge of the Father was that in his own name he would keep them. Jesus said, I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but I pray that you would keep them from the evil one. And our Lord Jesus never prayed anything that the Father did not hear and answer. He never asked his Father to do anything he couldn't do. And he did not commit us to the loving hands of his Father in heaven while on the threshold of his death with any doubt as to what the Father would do in granting those requests and keeping us. We are kept, we will be kept, we shall be kept throughout eternity from the power of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Though we may be tempted, and though we may be tried, and though the world and the flesh and the devil may take a toll in our lives from time to time, we are in no eternal danger from any source. Jesus and his Father are one, and we are in his Father's hand, and none is able to pluck us from that hand. So we are in no danger from the world, and we are in no danger from Antichrist. The unsaved are in great danger. They will be given strong delusion that they might believe a lie in the day of the Antichrist. And even now, in this age of grace, when there are many Antichrists, the unsaved are being seduced from day to day. 
And the Antichrist never give up, for they try also to seduce the believer. But we are in no real danger from the Antichrist that we learned about last Sunday morning. They cannot successfully seduce us, as I will show in a little while. Therefore, why does John bother to exhort us along this line? For this simple reason, to remove from us whatever concern we may have, and to take from our hearts whatever fear we may foster in this regard. Have you ever wondered about yourself, whether or not you would remain steadfast in the faith that has been revealed to you? You see, on every hand in the religious world today, we are told that we are in danger of falling. We are in danger of being seduced. We are in danger of being led astray, in danger of being carried off, and reverting to even an open denial of the things we once professed to believe. And good reason for us to be alarmed from time to time because the word is filled with warning along that line. We learned last Sunday about many who were antichrists, who continued to call themselves believers, but who went out from us in order that it might be proven to us and to them that they never were one of us at all. For had they been one of us, they no doubt would have continued with us, but they went out from us. They went out from us denying that Jesus is the Christ and hence are liars and antichrists. Or they didn't go out saying we don't believe in Jesus. But to believe that Jesus is the Christ involves believing the written record God has given of his Son in his person and in his work. Many people say they believe in Jesus Christ. And many say they believe that he's the Son of God and they believe that he died at the cross of Calvary, and they believe that he was buried, and they believe that he was raised again, and they believe that he's coming again. And many of these same people who can profess all of those things are still antichrist, and they're still liars, and they're still working at seducing the saints. For what they really mean by that is they believe what they want to believe about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They believe what they want to believe about his deity, about his person, his merits and his work. They believe in salvation by grace, but it is their interpretation of that grace that they believe. And so John warns against these. They are apostates. They once professed a faith and now have twisted and warped and perverted it to their own liking, yet calling themselves Christians. And John warns in verse 26 that they try to seduce believers. Now, in the Greek, we are led to believe that this is their occupation. This is their life calling. They are obsessed with the idea of seducing other believers. The word seduce means to lead astray, means to deceive. It means to cause one to wander out of the path. It means to make one rove about as a tramp, to make them spiritual tramps, in other words, to lead them out of the right way and make them wander around aimlessly, to deceive them, to lead them astray, seduce them. Now let me give you some of the warnings from the scripture in regards to this. Have you ever been concerned about yourself? You know what you believe? You know what's been revealed to you? You're out here in the world that is more religious than it has ever been at any time in history. Walking around out here in this religious world are thousands of antichrists. Men and women who profess to believe what you believe, but in reality believe that which is against our Lord Jesus Christ. They work on the believer. They try to lead him astray. They deliberately try to seduce him from that which has been made known to him by the Holy Spirit. They try to make a spiritual tramp out of him, cause him to be tossed to and fro and wander about aimlessly out of the path of the truth. Such warnings as these are given in the scripture. Jesus said in Luke 18, when the Son of Man come, will he find faith on earth? He meant the faith, the true faith. 
That's how terrible a time of apostasy this age will end in. In 1 Timothy, Paul warns Timothy, and he said that in the end times there would be seducing spirits, doctrines of demons. The world would be filled with spirit-filled men, but not Holy Spirit-filled men, but demon-filled men, whose main purpose in life was teaching, teaching doctrines made known to them by evil spirits that they might seduce and lead others astray. So they are called seducing spirits. Paul warns in the second epistle to Timothy, and he says that there would come a time, and we're in that time now, when people generally would refuse to hear the truth, turn away their ears from the truth, would heap to themselves teachers because they have itching ears. And these teachers would turn them to fables and turn them away from the true things of God. The Greek says they will accumulate teachers and pies. So Paul warns Timothy of a time when the world generally will accumulate many, many teachers. And these teachers will turn them away from the true word of God and turn them to fables in its place. Paul warns in 2 Thessalonians that in the end times, when the spirit of Antichrist has prevailed, that the Antichrist himself will be presented on the scene of human history. And the world in general will be given strong delusion that they might believe that lie. And so, believing in Antichrist, while all of the time supposing, supposing, and assuming that they believe in the true Lord Jesus Christ. That's terrible delusion. We should not marvel at that delusion of the tribulation time. We're seeing the forerunner of it now. Millions of people, while I preached this morning, have believed Antichrist, have believed the doctrines of seducing spirits, and imagined themselves to be true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jude 4... Jude warns of men who will creep in unawares, who will ooze in through the cracks, who will present something that sounds so much like the truth that many people will be seduced. And Peter warns of the false prophets who will come preaching and many will follow their pernicious ways even though the essence of what they preach is an open denial of the Lord at bottom. Now, because of these warnings, many true believers, many who are really saved, many of God's little children become concerned when they read these things. And they begin to say, what a terrible thing if I should be seduced from the truth. What an awful thing if I should be deceived and let off like a wandering tramp. You have reason to be concerned from this standpoint. You look back in your past history, and before you were saved, that's exactly what you were. You were tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine that blew upon you. You followed every teacher that came down the pike. You read everything you could get your hands on and believed it all. And Satan loves to tell the saint of God it's no different now. Let some persuasive man come along and teach something that sounds like the truth and it may be fatal error, and I'll believe it. Don't we have any assurance? Don't we have any confidence from God that this can't happen to us? After all, we're human beings. We're not God. We're not omniscient. We don't know everything. Men are persuasive, aren't they? They're eloquent. They can sway us. They can change our thinking. They can get us mixed up. They can confuse us. Haven't you ever thought along this line? That's the reason John brings the subject up. Because all of God's people have thought along this line at one time or another. Wondering if they could really withstand an antichrist if he were persuasive and eloquent and reasonable in his arguments wondering if we would really know the difference if some false prophet 
just change the gospel enough to pervert it into a message of judgment. And we believed it. How can we be sure, brethren, that we will not be deceived and led astray and seduced by the many antichrists who are present with us now? Well, verse 20 says that there is nothing to worry about. Isn't that wonderful? Nothing to worry about. Listen to what it says. But, and the Greek brings out that John is emphasizing this, but as far as you're concerned, yes, I've told you about the Antichrist. I've told you what they are and who they are, but as far as you are concerned, you little children, you have an unction from the Holy One, and you all know. I didn't write to you because you didn't know the truth. I wrote to you because you know it. And no lie is of the truth. Now listen to me. We have something as believers that makes it impossible for us to ever become apostates. We have something that makes it impossible for us to be deceived in regards to Jesus as the Christ. We have something from God that has given us eternal protection against the seducing spirits that are loose in this world. If you are a true believer, you will never be anything less. You cannot be seduced. You cannot be led astray. You cannot be deceived in regards to Jesus in his person and his work. Let me distinguish between this seducing into apostasy, that's one thing, and error, which is common to all of us, and heresy, which is possible to every believer. Heresy means to choose instead of the truth. In other words, let's supposing that in regards to some minor doctrine, you have been taught in times past in a certain way, and you cling to that idea only because you do not understand the truth in regards to that doctrine. If it is a doctrine that is not vital to the person and work of Christ, it is considered in the scripture as mere heresy or holding one's own opinion on that matter. This is referred to as Paul by Paul as a snare of the devil into which we often fall as believers, clinging to our own opinion when we are faced with the truth in regards to matter. Then there is common error. Many of the saints of the New Testament fell into common error. Paul and Peter fell into error. Paul had to rebuke him to his face for the error that he fell into. If there had been no error among the Christians, Paul would not have had much to write about, for much of his writings are to correct the error held by Christian assemblies of his time. All of us cling yet to some error simply because of the absence of of proper teaching on that truth. But no believer can ever deny that Jesus is the Christ. And no believer can ever turn away from the finished work of the Lord Jesus as the grounds of his righteousness and redemption once it has been revealed and made known to him. You may have lots of questions in your mind about baptism. You may not understand how it fits in or how, what the verses mean that talk about them in the Bible. But you know, John says, about Jesus and you know about his work and you know what he did for you and you know who he is and nobody's ever going to confuse you on that. Now, that's the part that's wonderful to me. I don't care what you believe about baptism. It doesn't bother me. I know what I believe about it and that may only be my opinion. What you believe about it may only be your opinion. But brethren, what we know about Jesus and what we know about the work of the cross, nobody will ever take away from us or change our minds or hearts about it. Because we have something that prevents that from happening. <laughs> it's called an unction. Now the word has been so terribly misused because an unction, well... People think when you have an unction, you got some kind of holy fire on you. You've heard the story about the old preacher that was praying, Lord, give me an unction. 
And somebody said to him, what is an unction? He said, I don't know what it is, but I know what it ain't. So he was praying for something he didn't know what it was, but he knew when he didn't have it. Some kind of a feeling of power or endowment, and he was partially right. But the word unction means the same as the word anointing. And it's interesting to know that the root of this word is also the root of the word Christ. For the word Christ means anointed. Now, there's a difference between the one who anoints, the one who is anointed, and that which he's anointed with. And this word means particularly the anointing oil itself. You have the ointment. You have the oil. You have the unction, the anointing itself. What does it mean? Well, verse 27 makes a strange statement about this unction. It ascribes personality to this unction. For it says, Ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things. It goes on to say, And it hath taught you. So the anointing, or the unction, has the capacity to teach believers. And John speaks of his unction as having already taught every believer. Well, you know that this unction and this anointing is the Holy Spirit himself. In John 16, when Jesus told his disciples about the coming of the Holy Spirit, he ascribed to him that ministry in the lives of the saints. He would teach them. He was to bring all things to their remembrance, whatever he had said to them. He will teach you all things. And he gives the subject of his teaching. The subject of his teaching is Jesus himself. And the result of his teaching would be to glorify Jesus in the hearts of his people. Now John says that we have this blessed Holy Spirit and his work as the anointing. This is just a part, you see, of the work of the Holy Spirit. He's also our seal. He also prays in us, and etc. He comforts us. He has many ministries. This is a part of his ministry. A part of it is to be our unction, to be our anointing. And in the office of anointer, or anointed, he is the teacher. The Holy Spirit has taught each of us about Jesus so as to glorify him in our hearts. To put upon him the glory that God desires, the Holy Spirit has revealed him to us, made us to see, made us to know him in a way that no seducer can ever take that away from us, no deception can ever change that in our hearts, no false teaching can ever undo what the teacher has done. The Holy Spirit is the teacher of the saints. And in his work as the unction, the anointing, he has enabled us to know all things. This will become plainer as we go along. Now Paul says we have this anointing from the Holy One. Specifically, he refers to God the Father refers to God the Father because in 2 Corinthians 1.21, Paul says that we have this anointing from God. God granted this anointing to each believer in response to the prayer and the desire of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus prayed his Father that we might have the unction of the Holy Spirit himself. Not an unction which the Holy Spirit gives, but the Holy Spirit himself being the unction. You with me? So we have this from the Holy One in response to the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ for the purpose of protecting us forever from the seducing of Antichrist. Now, there isn't much in the New Testament on the subject of anointing or unction. You will only find
divide it in two passages. Very little of nothing, practically, on the subject. But John, being an instructed and educated Jew and writing to those who were of that, also of that lineage, this is a subject that was so familiar among the Jews that I think he assumes we all must understand more about it than we do. Fortunately, the Old Testament is filled with instruction on the unction. As we look in the Old Testament, we find that God had three offices in which men were installed by official anointing. You know what they are, don't you? Prophet, priest, and king. Any man elevated to the office of prophet was signified by a public anointing. Any man installed as high priest was publicly anointed. And any man who ascended to the throne in Israel was publicly anointed. They poured anointing oil on his head. Now I'm going to read about it in a little bit. And thereafter he was referred to as the Lord's anointed. The Lord's Christ. So you see the Old Testament prophecies are filled with prophecies about the Lord's anointed who would come. That's Jesus. For this anointed one that was to come, not like any other anointed one who had already come, was to be God himself, Emmanuel, or God with us. And he was to fulfill the types of the Old Testament prophet, priest, and king. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the prophetic office. He's the fulfillment of all of the priestly office. And he is the counterpart, the reality of all the kings who ever reigned in the anointing of God. He's king of kings and lord of lords. But here in this passage, we are told that we, believers, are the anointed of God. And we also read in the New Testament, I thank God for it, that we are priests unto God and his Father. In the, new, in the book of Revelation, we are told that we are kings and priests. And in the New Testament, we are also told that the very ministry of prophecy, not predicting future events, but the telling forth of the word of God has also been committed to us. We are the only anointed prophets, priests, and kings in the world today. And every believer is just that in the sight of God. In the Old Testament, when these prophets, priests, and kings were anointed, there came with the anointing a supernatural, a spiritual endowment, enablement, gift to fulfill the obligations of the office, if you will, please. When a prophet was installed and anointed of God, he received the gift of prophecy, the enablement to hear God's word and tell it to the people. When a king was elevated to the office and anointed at the hand of God, he received the wisdom, as did Solomon, the grace, the strength, and whatever else was necessary to administer that office under God. And when the priests were installed in the office of priests, their hands were filled with whatever were needed to fulfill the obligations of that office. I was reading again in uh, the 8th chapter of Leviticus. I'm going to read a part of it to you. In the 8th chapter of Leviticus, we have the consecration of the priest. If you will study that carefully at home, you will have step by step the procedure of anointing. First in verse 1, the Lord spake to Moses and said, Take Aaron. So Aaron was chosen for this office, and anointed to this office by the word of God. And in verse 5 it says, this is the thing that the Lord hath commanded. In verse 6, Aaron was washed with water. First he was called and chosen by the word of God, and secondly he was washed, and third he was clothed. They put upon him the coat, 
the girdle, the ephod, the girdle of the ephod, the breastplate that had the Urim and thumb of them. They put upon his brow the mitre and the golden plate and the holy crown. And after he'd been chosen and called and washed and clothed, in verses 10 through 12, he was anointed. The precious anointing oil was poured upon the head of Aaron, and he was at that moment anointed and sanctified, which means set apart for God in that office. In verse 23, the next thing that happened was that upon his right ear, upon his right, the thumb of his right hand and the great toe of his right foot, he was touched with the blood of sacrifice. And in verses 26 through 27, his hands were filled with gifts for God. And in verse 28, those gifts were accepted from his hands as a sweet savor offering unto the Lord. In verse 31, he was provided with all the food he needed. And in verses 33 to 36, he was charged with perpetual abiding at the door of the tabernacle with continual entrance and access into the presence of God. <laughs> now, I hope you got a blessing out of that. We are New Testament <coughs> priests. We also have been chosen and called by the Word of God. And we also have had our anointing to that office. And the anointing to that office is the person of the Holy Spirit himself who is given to every believing sinner. The moment you were saved, all that was done in the life of Aaron was done for you in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Do you know what happened to you? You were washed. Unto him who loved us, John says, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Ephesians 5.25 says he washed us with water, that water of the precious word of God. And in John 13, in the upper room, at the incident of the foot washing, Jesus reminded those that were there that if a man was saved, he had been wholly bathed. Bathed not in material water, literal water, not washed in some actual cleansing agent, the word of God had cleansed him by the power of the blood of Christ. The very moment that we believe, the moment we pass from death unto life, the moment we were saved, God anointed us with a holy anointing. That anointing is the Holy Spirit. In that anointing, we were called, chosen, cleansed, and then clothed in the garments of glory that are reserved for the presence of God. You know what the garments of glory are? Aaron didn't make those clothes. He was stripped of everything that he had always worn. Everything that belonged to Aaron was taken from him in the presence of God. And in its place were garments of glory prepared by God himself. And Aaron was to wear them in his presence forever. He couldn't come into the presence of God without those garments of glory. My dear friends, when you and I were saved, God imputed to us and counted to us and reckoned to us the righteousness of himself in Jesus Christ. He clothed us with the garments of Christ's glory and imputed to us all of the merits of his own blessed Son. He saw us hidden in Christ so that Paul could say, My life is hid with Christ in God. When God looks upon his children, he looks upon Christ. What he sees in me, he sees me in Jesus. So we were clothed, not only washed, but clothed. And at that same time, we were anointed with the Holy Spirit himself. And the result of that anointing is that we were sanctified. Now read in the 10th chapter of Hebrews. To be sanctified does not mean that we are without sin. There was never any meaning like that attached to the word. It means that we were at that moment set apart for God for the rest of eternity. It means that we were marked out from among all other men to belong to him forever. It means at that moment we became his. 
and his purposes were to be worked out in our life, and in that office his way was to be had in our hearts. Why, my, in the New Testament you can read about the most unspiritual people that were sanctified. The Corinthians are a good example. Fighting among themselves so carnal that Paul said he couldn't even discuss the deeper things of the truth with them. So carnal and so fleshly that they were puffed up with pride and measured one another by themselves and allowed open sin in the assembly. Yet Paul referred to them as being sanctified. Referred to them as being saints. Not because they were sinless, but because they had been placed in the Holy One, the Lord Jesus Christ, by the work of the Holy Spirit. And this is one of the things that I like. We, like that Old Testament priest, were not only chosen and called by the Word of God and washed and cleansed and clothed in the garments of glory, anointed with the Holy Spirit and set apart for God for all eternity. But I'm thankful that the blood has also touched us in our hands, our ears, and our feet. That means that the whole body has been touched also by the blood of Christ. There was a change in Aaron from that day on, and there's been a change in us. We hear like we never heard before. Our hands are enabled to do what we were never enabled to do before. And our feet enable us to go where we could never go before and keep us from going where we ought not to go. It was significant that the blood was placed upon the ear, the thumb of the right hand, and the great toe of the right foot, signifying that the whole body had been touched and changed and cleansed and affected and empowered and enabled by the same blood of sacrifice that had cleansed them and installed them in that glorious office. And then when that was complete, bread and oiled bread and cakes and wafers and a part of the sacrifice itself was placed in the open hands of Aaron. He had nothing of himself that he could give. He had nothing of himself that he could offer that was acceptable. But placed in his hands were suitable gifts that he could offer and God would accept. And we find that immediately following this, that he took them and offered them on the burnt offering, uh, uh, altar, and they were accepted as a sweet savor offering unto the Lord. That's what happens when we're saved. We don't have anything we can give to God. We don't have anything we can offer to him in an acceptable manner. When we are called and when we are cleansed and when we are clothed and when we are anointed and set apart for God, when our bodies, our lives, our hearts have been changed and touched by the blood of Christ, we also find that God has given to us some portion of Christ that we can give back to him and in so doing offer to him an acceptable offering. And then the perpetual food supply was offered to these priests of old. Food that was from the very sanctuary of God, the bread, and that's Jesus. And so the priests who have been properly anointed and set apart have also been made to feed upon the bread from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. And now let me close this little part of Leviticus 8 on this one glorious truth. When it was all said and done and finished, and Aaron stood there anointed, installed in the office, his hands filled with suitable sacrifices, his heart undoubtedly filled to overflowing with the joy of knowing that he was in this precious relationship to God. He was told that he could not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation until the days of his consecration were at an end. But it was told to him that he must abide at the door and he must keep the charge that God had given to him. His days of consecration ended in seven days Ours will never end. For we were not anointed with real oil. We were anointed with the oil of the Holy Spirit. And having received the eternal Spirit of God, we have been installed and anointed in the eternal office of priests unto God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ forever. And you know what we're destined to do? Abide 
at the door, at the place of fellowship and communion forever and ever and ever, and keep the charge, not because we must hold out faithful, but we will keep the charge, for in having been anointed to this office, we have received from him the endowment necessary for the fulfillment of his obligations. Do you know who the door is? Jesus. And I'll tell you what hard thing God has given to us to do. Abide in the door. <laughs> that doesn't sound so bad, does it? Just have fellowship in the door. Just stand around in the door. Just enjoy yourself in the door. That's all. anointed when we were saved. But then there is another truth that tells us that we were anointed when he was anointed. Now you know, when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, he died a substitute. You know that. If you're saved, you know that. When he died on the cross of Calvary, he died for me. He took my place. All that I was was imputed to him. All my sins and my iniquities and my transgressions were laid upon him, and he bare them in his own body on the tree. But more than that, when he died, he was made sin for me. Though he knew no sin, that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. So when he died in the sight of God, as far as God is concerned, I died. And when he was buried, it was me they buried. And when God raised him from among the dead ones, it was me God raised from among the dead ones with no charge that could be laid to me, his elect. And you know what happened to the Lord Jesus and consequently what happened to me when he was raised from the dead? Well, we are told in the New Testament that he was caught up into the very presence of God. And he faced God in the Holy of Holies. And God looked upon him and was satisfied in the work he had done and invited him to sit in the very throne of God at his right hand and he promised him he'd make all of his enemies his footstool. And he did something for him and it was recorded in the 45th Psalm years ago by David who saw it in prophecy. God anointed him with the oil of gladness above all his fellows and officially anointed him and installed him as the eternal prophet, priest, and king in whom all his glory would reside for all eternity. And in the 133rd Psalm, which was also prophetic of that, and you can read when you go home today, the psalmist comments on it about the unity of the brethren and how precious it was. And he said that when the anointing oil was poured upon the head of Aaron, it not only flowed down over his beard, but also onto his garment and clear to the very hem, the very lowliest part of the body of that priest. Jesus is the head of the true body, the church. And we are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh and members one of another. And when our Father anointed him in heaven that day with the oil of gladness above all his fellows, the oil of that anointing not only flowed over the head, it flowed to every part of the body. And all who are in that body, all who are sinners saved by grace, all who have come to Jesus by the work of the cross, share the same anointing that was given to him that day. Now that's good news. Now, what is this anointing in its practical aspect. What does it mean to me? Oh, that's up there in the sky. Oh, it has a very practical aspect, and it's this. It results in me knowing. Know. Isn't that a wonderful word? You know, there's a lot of people who don't know. I know. What do you know? What kind of knowledge do you have? Well, here is the first time we've run into this word I've been telling you about. This word I said we'd run into in 1 John, here it is. 
I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, because ye know it, and no lie is of the truth. Here's what this anointing means to me, because I have this anointing from God, I know the truth. Now let me tell you what know means. It means absolute and final knowledge. It means beyond the peradventure of a doubt. It means an intuition of assured and satisfied conviction. It means a clear inward consciousness. And three times in the New Testament it is translated to see or saw and refers to an eyewitness account. It simply means that because I have this ocean, I have an absolute, final, eyewitness knowledge of the truth of God. Oh, you mean you know all the doctrines of the Bible? No. This is what John has in mind. John has in mind the truth as it is resident in Jesus. For he opens this blessed book by talking about this eternal word which he had handled, which he had seen with his own eyes and heard with his own ears and knew with his own heart. And just to sum it up so that there won't be any doubt as to what I'm talking about. Every saved man and woman, boy and girl, whether he can read or he can't read, whether he has any man-made knowledge or no, he knows in his heart with an absolute, final, satisfied, assured conviction of an inward consciousness beyond any peradventure of a doubt. He knows the Lord Jesus Christ as he is in God, and he knows the Lord Jesus as he has been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. He's seen the cross for what it is, and he's seen the Savior who died on that cross for who he is and what he is, and he'll never see anything else as long as he lives. Never. I may change my mind a thousand times about theological things, but nobody and no thing can change what I have seen in Jesus at the cross of Calvary. You with me? That's good news. <laughs> Let me put it around and turn it around a little bit. This is why he says that we don't have any need. You need not that any man teach you. Well, what am I doing up here then? Why don't we just close up and go home? Why should I come down here and teach? That's what I say I do. Oh, John is not saying there are no teachers used of God. God has already approved and ordained the teaching shepherds of the New Testament. Their authority is given to us in unmistakable terms. Here's what he's saying. You don't need any man to tell you whether what you hear is the truth or not. You know that by experience, don't you? You don't have to have any program to guide you so that you will know when a man tells a lie or whether he tells the truth. Every believer knows the truth when he hears it. He also recognizes the absence of that truth when he doesn't hear it. What he hears may be interesting, it may be religious, it may be thought-provoking, it may be enlightening. But the Christian has one instinct which cannot be subdued in him. Whenever he hears Jesus' voice, he recognizes it. And when he doesn't hear it, he recognizes the absence of it. He may not know how to describe it, Pity the poor saints of God who sit in some dried-up religious mausoleum this morning, listening to some dried-up minister of religion go on and on, droning in his monotone about the social problems of today and etc. Pity the poor saint of God who sits there with this upon his heart, they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they've laid him. There may not be a thing wrong with what the man says as far as lies are concerned, but that poor saint of God sits there with hungry heart knowing 
He knows Jesus when he sees him and he hasn't seen him. He knows Jesus when he hears him and he hasn't heard him. He senses Jesus present when he's present and he wasn't present. Mary didn't have sense enough to know Jesus from the garden. But she knew one thing. She knew what she wanted. And she knew she'd stay right there in the last place she saw him until he was made known to her. And that's what many, many, many of God's dear people are doing today. They're staying in the same place they seen him the last time, hoping that they'll see him once more. If somebody could go in those old tombs and tell them that Jesus isn't there, they'd never come back there again as long as they live. Take some angel from heaven. They have to roll the sun away and show them. Do you know, and I'm telling you things that you were not here in the religious world because they tell you the opposite. Do you know it's impossible for a true sheep of the Lord Jesus Christ to follow a false shepherd? So as to deny that true shepherd? Never. Jesus said so in John 10. He said, my sheep hear my voice. They know my voice, he said. And what did he say? He said, they follow me. What did he say about the voice of strangers? Oh, he said, the voice of strangers, they won't follow. Well, what do you do when you hear the voice of strangers? They're afraid. I didn't know where I was going to be here this morning, but you know, if I hadn't been here this morning and another man had stood here, let's say a man you didn't know, and he stood up here and he began to talk, and he talked, but there was something wrong with what he was saying. Maybe everything he said was true. Maybe everything he said was interesting. And maybe everything he said was enlightening or thought-provoking or anything else that you want to call it. But there was a testimony in your heart that this man wasn't talking about the Jesus that you know. And you didn't see the Jesus that you came to see. And you went away longing for the fellowship and presence of that Jesus. And it wasn't made manifest to you. Would you have to call me up when you got home and say, uh, am I supposed to believe everything that man said? No, you wouldn't have to call me up and ask me anything. Because you wouldn't have any need that any man teach you about what you heard or what you saw here in this hall this morning. Right? Every time you turn your radio on, you have to call me up and say, is it all right to listen to so-and-so? Every time somebody hands you a tract, do you have to call me up and say, I have a tract here, is it good? Shall I read it? No, you don't have to ask me anything. Because you don't have any need that any man teach you what is truth and what is not truth. You know the truth. This is a wonderful thing. It's a blessed thing. And this anointing abides with us forever. That anointing can never be taken from us. Having been anointed to the office, we will be in that office throughout eternity. And nothing can change that anointing, and we have no need to be taught. Now, Paul says that in the last days, the world will have to have teachers. So they're going to heap to themselves piles of teachers. I feel sorry for these people. I meet them every day almost of my life, caught up in religion. And if you press the truth upon their hearts, the only thing they end up saying is, well, uh, I don't know. I tell you what, I get my preacher and come over. He can answer your questions. Uh, I don't know, ask the priest. He can tell you. Go to some man because I don't really know what's right and what's wrong. That's what they're saying to you. They don't know the truth, but you know. You know the truth. And this is one of the reasons why, I don't know whether you ever noticed this or not, but I don't... Uh, I don't give any courses on comparative religions. I don't waste my time telling you what other people believe. I don't say now we're on oh, Wednesday night I'm going to preach on Catholicism. And I'm going to tell you all the fallacies of Catholic doctrine. Then on Sunday morning I'm going to preach on the Camelites, and I'm going to tell you all the error of Camelite doctrine. And the reason I'm going to preach on these things is because I want God's people to be informed. So when they hear these things, they will know they're not true. You all have to do is preach the truth. And when the truth is being made known to you, all the error in the world will become apparent. Great day in the morning.
I could give you an extended course on Camelite doctrine. But two minutes in the presence of a Camelite and you'll know more about the truth and more about his honor than I could ever teach you. Because about the first thing that comes out of his mouth about being baptized for the remission of your sin, and you'll say, man, you don't even know the gospel. What else could you know that would be enlightening to man? All I have to do is see that God's people are established in the truth, and the error is of no importance. I don't waste my time on the negative. I don't have to. I learned this from Ephesians 5 many years ago, and I wasted some precious years preaching that in negative. But I learned one day in Ephesians 5, you didn't have to do that. It said that the unfaithful works of darkness were made manifest by what? The light. <laughs> you know, it's the hell she's just go around turning the light on. And then you won't have to tell people what's the day. And it said, oh, you play. <laughs> Isn't that silly? Yes, I suppose you go to my house like this. We get down to the basement. We get down to the basement, we're groping our way down. We stand down there and we say, What are we doing now? Well, I'll tell you what's in my basement. <laughs> so, over in this corner, there's a deep freeze. It's about this wide, it's about that high, and it has a handle on the left hand side. And you're standing there saying, Well, why don't you just turn the light on? Let me look at it. <coughs> oh, no, 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 no. I want to describe all these unfruitful works of darkness to you. All we have to do is just turn the switch on, and when the light comes on, you see all you need to see. And this is the way it is in our hearts when the light comes on, when the light comes in, when the Lord Jesus has his rightful place in our hearts, we see all there is to see in our We know. We know. And John says, I write to you because you do know. I don't write to you because you don't know the truth and I'm afraid you'll be deceived and seduced and led astray and made apostate. I don't write to you because I'm worried that you're going to be carried off by the Antichrist and the false teachers. I write to you to assure you that you have nothing to worry about because you know. And you know because you have this blessed anointing from the Holy Spirit himself. You shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you what? Free. Let us pray. Father, thank you this morning for this blessed, wonderful, precious assurance that we have an anointing. We've seen the truth. We've known the truth. It has been given to our hearts in an absolute and final manner. Having seen Jesus as our substitute at the cross of Calvary, we can never, never see him in any other light. Thank you for this remembrance. And Father, we would ask this morning that if there should be anyone in this room who has not that anointing, who has never been saved, who has never come to rest in Jesus, that they will now this morning, by faith in Jesus Christ, cast all of their eternal weight upon him and the destiny of their eternal souls upon him. And by faith, enter into him. And receive also this anointing that precludes any possibility of them ever becoming apostate or wandering around like spiritual tramps in the truth of the gospel. Thank you, Father, for this assurance. We are saved and sealed and sure for eternity. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you.